got it. All right, well, welcome everyone. We'll just wait a few minutes while people connect in, but we've got lots of people joining us uh, from all around the world. I know already I can see some familiar names. Um, so while people join in, we'll just let everyone get their computers set up. I'm, I, I say this every time, but I'm going, I make a rod for my own back, but um, I'm sure we have people from North America. Um, we normally have people from Melbourne. There's a great interest in church archaeology in Melbourne, um, as well as closer to home. Um, and of course, we do also usually have people from Ireland, which is very appropriate given our speaker mm -hmm. tonight, which is great. Um, just while people are still connecting in, I would just like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, obviously, you're always welcome to come to our lectures, which we put on for free um, every month. Um, and the Society for Church Archaeology is very pleased to do so. I would always ask you to consider supporting our society because it's only through our members that we're able to put these lectures on. So um, if you look for our web page, if you're not a member, you can find out details about how to join and other activities uh, that we put on beyond just these evening lectures. Um, as our speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, is talking, if you have questions, and I'm sure you shall, um, if you just pop them in, into the uh, chat box and Rob will collate those questions and then field them to our speaker at the end of the talk. Um, and that will all go very smoothly. Um, we have, well, I have several, I have several things to announce that um, um, after, this talk um, next next month we have another speaker lined up who is Danica Ramsey Brimberg who is going to be talking about something rather different than tonight's talk which is uh, revisiting uh, Viking graves in the ecclesiastical and non-ecclesiastical context in the Irish Sea area so some some overlap geographically yeah. um, and also by next uh, month's lecture, I will be able to announce more details about our conference um, that's coming up in September. We have a variety of papers which we're just going through to pull together into a programme, but there are some quite exciting international offerings uh, from a, a variety of not just different countries, but different continents. So um, I'll be able to give you some details um, next uh, month when we meet then. Um, I think without any further ado, I will hand over to our speaker, who is Dr. Tracy Collins. Um, <clears throat> she studied at the university, sorry, University College in Cork um, and completed a PhD in 2016 on pretty much, I suspect, the topic we're going to hear about tonight on female monasticism. Um, and she now currently, I hope I'm up to date, uh, works for the National Monuments Service of Ireland. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Uh, absolutely excellent <laughs> so so is a vip archaeologist uh, from from ireland and tonight she's going to tell us or talk to us about female monasticism in ireland in context so i will hand over to tracy who will start sharing her powerpoint thank you very much i'll just put up my powerpoint presentation now Now, so I'll just go back. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, that's fantastic. Perfect. Great, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, if I was with you face to face, I would probably do this um, off the cuff without um, notes. But um, as I'm sitting here alone in my room, um, I thought it would be best that I would have um, a paper. Um, so, in this presentation, I will briefly discuss the medieval archaeology of female monasticism, religious women or nuns, and will then present the findings of the first research excavation of a nunnery in Ireland at St. Catharines, situated in the southwestern county of Limerick, where I'm from, in the province of Munster. So, the archaeological study of female monasticism in medieval Ireland has been up to recently a totally understudied theme in Irish archaeology. 
there are at least 51 monuments associated with female religious of the early medieval period, which dates approximately from uh, AD 450 to about 1100, and numerous other sites tentatively identified with early female religious. And these would be the sites associated with St. Bridget and St. Monina, um, such as Clevey or Kildare. For the later medieval period, which for Ireland is about 1100 to 1540, the 12th century when the church in Ireland was reformed through to the mid 16th century and the dissolution of the monasteries. Some 65 sites are identified as nunneries, uh, which, you, which you can see on the left hand side there. Um, 65 nunneries um, on the island of Ireland dating to this period being founded from the 12th century right through to the early 16th century. And of these 65 sites, about half have some sort of archaeological signature or upstanding remains. Indeed, the vast majority of nunneries are considered Augustinian or Augustinian of Arawasian observance. And it has been suggested that the popularity of the Augustinian order in Ireland for female religious houses is a legacy of St. Malachy from the 12th century, who was purported to have introduced this order and also um, to its relative flexibility in comparison to other monastic rules. Also, it should not be overlooked that the ethos of a particular religious order may have been a deciding factor in the identity of a nunnery, although this is particularly difficult to prove due to a complete lack of contemporary documentation for medieval nunneries in Ireland, which makes the archaeology all the more important. So nunneries in medieval Ireland were also affiliated to the Benedictine, Cistercian and Franciscan and Poor Clare orders. And Miriam Klein has con concluded that there were no female houses of the pre Premonstratensian order in medieval Ireland. There are no known Dominican nunneries, um, but evidence identified by Andrea Knox in late medieval and early modern Irish Dominican convents in Spain does suggest that there was a later medieval Dominican nun nunnery operating somewhere in the port town of Galway. So prior to my research, there had not been a dedicated research excavation of a later medieval nunnery in Ireland. And this evening, I'd like to present an overview of those excavations and the findings, particularly in relation to space, place, and identity of the nuns that um, use St. Catherine's. So the medieval Augustinian nunnery of St. Catherine de Connell is situated in West County Limerick in the barony of Connellow and the civil parish of Old Abbey. It lies relatively close to the contemporary medieval settlements of Askeaton, Newcastle West, Rathkeel and Shanna Golden. And you can see here that um, the nunnery is, is just here where the red square is. The overarching strategy of the excavation was a simple one to investigate a medieval nunnery and hopefully produce some interesting results as part of my research. And St. Catherine's was chosen for excavation because of its excellent upstanding remains, and it is arguably the best preserved medieval nunnery in Ireland, and only one of three in the country with extant cloistral complexes. It was not substantially changed or reused after its dissolution, and it does not appear that it was used for post-nunnery burial. And there is no tradition of later burial at the site at all. And finally, and not to be underestimated, the owners of the site, the Guiney family, were willing to give permission to excavate. So we started off with some geophysical survey, resistivity and magnetometer, which was undertaken to the north of the nunnery. But suffice to say here that the results were somewhat disappointing and no medieval structures or features were identified immediately outside the cloister. So St. Catherine's is situated in the ancient area of uh, Canelo and within the territory of the later medieval Anglo-Normans or Anglo-Irish as they're called, the Earls of Desmond, who were the benefactors of the nunneries and their ancestors were the founders. Begley records the nunnery was built on sea lands of the Bishop of Limerick, for which the Earls of Desmond paid an annual rent. It is still locally known by its Irish name, Monaster Nicolaeup Dove, or the Monastery of the Black Nuns, as recorded here on the mid 19th century first edition six inch map. St. Catherine's precise foundation date is unknown, though it was likely it was in the mid 13th century, as it is recorded that its founder, John Fitzthomas of Shannon, 
was killed at the Battle of Callan in 1261. So it is likely that the nunnery was in existence prior to that date. And this information um, comes much later to us as it appeared in an acquisition of a grandson, Thomas Fitzmaurice, who died in 1298. So the extant architecture of the nunnery supports the foundation date of between the 1240s and the 1260s. The nunnery was located centrally to many Desmond strongholds, Shannon Castle to the southwest, Askeaton to the northeast and Newcastle west to the south. And after its dissolution, and the date of which is not precise either, the nunnery was granted in 1567, um, along with a number of religious houses, to Sir Warham St. Ledger, who, leased, who was leased then to James Gold in 1583 and was re-granted to Sir Hugh Wallop in 1594. So eventually the nunnery became the outbuildings of a new country house known as Old Abbey, which you can see here on the 19th century map, just up here. This is actually the house. Uh, this house was raised in the 1980s, but fortunately its outbuildings and the nunnery complex were maintained. So this was always maintained as um, outbuildings to, to the, the house. St. Catherine's was very fortunate, <clears throat> excuse me, as in the late 19th and early 20th century, Old Abbey House was the home of Limerick man, Professor John Wardell of Trinity College in Dublin. Together with the nationally famous TJ Westrop, um, an antiquarian and archeologist, they co-published the History and Antiquities of St. Catherine's Old Abbey, County Limerick in 1904. Wardell collating the documentary evidence and local history of which he was a passionate advocate and Westrop describing and drawing the remains in his usual excellent and insightful style. This 1904 article remained the only detailed publication to date on the nunnery until the published results of these excavations in 2019. So time today does not permit me to fully discuss the landed estates. I'm sorry, this is just an image of um, Westrop's excellent drawings from 1904. Um, and I know from comparing them with our modern surveys that they are accurate to within um, millimeters. Um, so he really was an excellent drafts person. So we don't have time this evening to discuss um, all the landed estate and rights and benefit, benefices that would have assisted in supporting the nunnery throughout its history. But suffice to say that St. Catherine's, which again is indicated here in red, it did possess a consolidated estate around its nunnery complex. The crosses on the slide indicate landholding, rents and rectories. So from the north, which is the top of the slide, St. Catherine's had holdings of the townlands of Ahanish, Robertstown, Carroclough, Mollat, Craggard, and Dunmoylan, and further afield, which are not marked, Grange near Newcastle West and Ballynockan near Croom. An important caveat to mention is that this probably does not represent all of the nunnery's holdings, and neither does it account for its change over, over time when the nunnery was in use. So St. Catherine's was cloisterally arranged and has evidence of a precinct area, though no precinct stone walls are upstanding, um, and it's debatable if it actually ever had a stone precinct wall. Um, and a home farm to the south of the cloister, you can see the, the cloistral area here, and the home farm area would have been down here. <clears throat> Which included um, a fish pond, dovecot, arched entranceway, hollow way, bridges, and evidence for water man management in channeled streams towards and around the nunnery. There is also a tantalizing po possibility that the nunnery had a contemporary secular settlement in the nearby fields to the, north to the northwest and east of the complex. So you can see the nunnery here and it's um, uh, precinct and home farm to the south and then these series of earthworks. Uh, which may be contemporary medieval settlement. And these are visible um, on, area photo on area photography, which you can see up here on the top left. However, without excavation, it is impossible to tell if the settlement predates the nunnery or if it sprang up around the nunnery when it was in use.
Now, as can be seen in the simplified ground plan, the cluster at St. Catharines is formed by two ranges to the west and south, here, west and south, um, which forms the dormitory and the refectory respectively. And the church projects, as I'm sure you noticed, from the east side of the cloister, which is an arrangement that's unique to Ireland and very rare abroad, and has a later small addition to its southwest known as the sacristy or black hag cell. So this little unit here was added in the 15th century. And Westrop has interpreted that as a sacristy, but we will return to that in a short while. The north side of the cloister was formed by a blank wall, and it appears that no range was ever constructed on this side. A structure extends southwards from the refectory, so down here. And this has been interpreted again by Westrop as a kitchen, and it was likely to be such. Um, a cloister garth or garden is extant, but there was no sign of a cloister or arcade wall prior to the excavations. Access to the cloister was originally in its southeast corner, so down here. But in the 15th century, this was changed to the northwest corner, so up here. And the remains are very overgrown, as you can see from the slide here. Um, so the sketch on the bottom right um, that a colleague of mine uh, drew up gives an impression of the upstanding remains today. So you have the central cloister, the church projecting from the east, the west range for the dormitory, the refectory, and the extension from the refectory um, known as the kitchen. Now, this is just to give you an impression of what the remains look like. And here are some images from the interior of the cloister. So this is the elaborate doorway, um, Western doorway into the perpendicular church and the smaller entranceway into the northern side of the cloister, which was inserted sometime in the 15th century. And the views of the West Range here and here, this is the exterior view and interior view, um, which is interpreted as a dormitory, um, had originally three vaulted rooms beneath, two of which could be accessed from the interior of the nunnery, and one could be accessed from the exterior. And this is the one you can see here. The architecture and upstanding archaeology at St. Catharines shows a nunnery changing over time as it is used, and the spaces were adjusted, and the archaeology mir mirrors these changes. <clears throat> so over the course of two seasons, nine trenches were excavated. Um, season one um, was really uh, the trenches one to four in yellow, and this was to test the potential of the site for the archaeological remains. Um, and following uh, this season, it was found that the, there was some rich archaeological remains there. And so we moved to season two, where trenches five to nine were excavated. And I might note here that trenches seven and nine here were looking at some geophysical anomalies which turned out to be 19th century, so I won't be discussing those any, any further. We'll be discussing the medieval remains. Um, so season two then uh, was uh, directed as excavations for University College Cork training excavation, which was held over a four-week period with some 40 students, the majority of those having had their first experience of excavation on the site. So trenches uh, one, two, and four, and you see here throughout, I'll use a little um, key. Again, if we were here in person, I would have given handouts. Um, so we have a little key of the simplified ground plan in the top corner. And the places where I'm discussing, I've just um, put the red box around them. So you've some indication of where we are within the cloister. So trenches one, two, and four investigated the church. Um, uh, one in four investigated the cloister ambulatory or walkway and the threshold of the west doorway into the church. Uh, there was no evidence of a clear threshold between the church and ambulatory. And the trench two, which we're looking at up here, uh, was placed at the east end of the church where the high altar would be expected. But this area was completely disturbed with burials. Um, and we retrieved a fragment of a, a medieval copper alloy candlestick. Um, from this area, which would be nice to think that it was used um, at 
on the high altar. And here's a reconstruction of what it may have looked like. Um, in trench two um, by the ambulatory, um, the ambulatory was found, or the walkway was found to have a stony metal surface and the trenches yielded several burials, which you can see here. And these were left in situ and undated because this was kind of our first season of um, testing. And you can see um, a male and children were found in this area. Uh, trench three was located in the refectory area um, in the location of the reader's recess. And this feature was identified in the architecture as a thinning of the refectory wall under into the east of several large lancet windows, um, which lit the space. Excavation found um, a, that a single step formed a higher area and there was no primary evidence for a timber or stone superstructure. Although the shorter lancet over the reader's recess suggests an arrangement shown here in a modern monastery. Uh, trench five, which we're here now, within the cloister area, investigated the cloister's garth and the northern ambulatory. The north ambulatory at three meters wide, uh, which was found here, was wider than that in the eastern ambulatory, which was 2.25 meters wide. Um, and the northern ambulatory would have allowed more working space at three meters wide. And this was the brightest area of the cloister as it was south facing. And burials were found in this walkway. The basal courses of a stone cloister arcade wall were uncovered, which indicated an original substantial arcade around this side of the garth, and you can see that in the trench. It appeared to have been deliberately removed, and no architectural fragments from the arcading were recovered. The garth or central garden was filled with several layers of silty loams, and the basal layer was made of fist-sized limestones, which you can see here, suggesting substantial preparation and infilling of the ground prior to the construction of the cloister arcade wall, which directly overlay it. Uh, no burials were found in the garden area, and it is suggested that the stony layer in the garden or garth aided drainage in a location where boulder clays form the subsoil, which are very prone to waterlogging. So the burials within this section of the North Ambulatory um, comprised four individuals, two females, a male, and a child aged three to four years. They ranged in date from the 12th century through to the early 17th century, although in some cases the date range, as you can see here, was quite large or wide. Interestingly, the earliest burial in the ambulatory was the child, dated to 1170 to 1270, which was likely buried in the very early years of use of the nunnery in the 13th century. Uh, Trench 8 investigated what Westrop labelled the kitchen. It was likely to be such being closest to a stream and off the refectory. From the architecture, it is clearly a later addition to the complex as it partially obscures the lancet windows of the refectory. And here it was found that the interior floor of the kitchen was earthen with hollows regularly filled with imported clay material. The foundation cut for the south wall um, was identified and several medieval fragments of medieval pottery were recovered. And we can see some here. So pottery finds are important as they indicate trade and consumables. At St. Catherine's, local Limerick and Adair types were found, along with sherds of Santange green glaze, which I think is the, the middle line there, indicating a wine trade from France. As can be seen in the slide, pottery was found in the refectory and kitchen, you can see the distribution here, um, where they might be expected to be found, but there was also a distribution in the ambulatories, and this may illustrate Gilker's suggestion that humility and piety in nunneries may be reflected in the relatively poor sanitation she noted in several English nunnery excavations. So trench six was located at the terminal of the north wall of the cloister, so just here, and we wanted to investigate this area here, um, because it was unclear from the architecture if this terminated in a buttress, as was used on the external east end of the church, or was it a continuation of a wall? It was quickly discovered, as you can see here, that the wall continued. Um, suggesting an original intention to construct an east range on this side. 
This interpretation was strengthened by first the several blocked doorways from the cloister that would have served a putative East Range. Second, the very elaborate church doorway, which we've seen earlier, which was perhaps originally intended as an um, East Range chapter house doorway. And third, a mortar layer suitable as an interior floor surface was found in Trench 6. So the north wall of the church, which you can see here, and this is the mortar layer in, in Trench 6, cut through this mortar layer, indicating that the church was later in construction. And several burials in this location also cut through the mortar layer. So when the mortar layer was mostly removed, it revealed several shallow hollows or depressions, context at 155 and 158, for example, that in other monastic excavations have been interpreted as the locations of supports for timber construction scaffolding. In other monastic excavations, it has been found that the area to the north of the church was used as the religious community's burial place. And this may have been the case at St. Catherine's as five individuals were found to be buried in Trench Six to the north of the church. Three adult females um, dated throughout the use of the nunnery and were buried here, and the dates are shown here on the slide. And an unsexed adult positioned in the foundation cut of the church um, uh, was also located and a child aged between five and six years. And this is the, um, the, the skeleton in the foundation cut of the church. Of the church. Sometimes in the study of extant architecture and archaeology, there is a tendency to see the monument as almost set in stone. So the close study of St. Catherine's coupled with the excavated evidence rather shows a monument that has changed over time. It seems that originally an East Range was planned for St. Catherine's, um, recognised in the excavated wall and mortared floor and the several blocked doorways. And the church may have been planned for the northern side of the cloister, which is now um, blank. But for some reason, which is now lost to us, and perhaps it was uh, financial reasons, this plan was not executed, and the church was constructed on the eastern side and highly unusually perpendicular to the cloister to re retain its all important east west axis. And I suggest that the church may have been placed this way in order to make use of the elaborate doorway that was already constructed in the east wall of the cloister, which was perhaps originally intended as a chapter house doorway, but was never used as such. So this leads us on to the use of space within the church. There are the partial remains of 23 nunnery churches in Ireland, and none correspond to significant medieval building ratios, and the vast majority are just simple rectangular structures without aisles or transepts. In the historical records, um, six are described as parish churches, and it is possible that a further seven may also have functioned as parish churches at some stage um, of their use. So when St. Catherine's was made parochial in the 15th century, its interior space was changed to accommodate the sharing of space with its wider local community and parishioners. Windows were blocks, blocked and the nun's elaborate west doorway was reduced to a very small doorway within it and a separate door to the outside in the north wall was inserted for use by the laity. This is the doorway that was inserted for the laity. The roof was replaced and the height of the roof was also raised. And like at Marrick in Yorkshire, um, a picture of it is, is shown here, I suggest that the west end of the church at St. Catherine's was used by the nuns, though there is no evidence of an upper floor gallery being employed to separate them fully from the laity. So they were all on the, on the ground floor. The nuns continued to use their west doorway, albeit reduced in size. The location of the nun's choir was perhaps marked by this incised ship that we identified in the plaster at the west end of the church's south wall. Um, and I've highlighted it in blue just so that it makes it more easy to see. The entrance to the cloister itself was also changed at this time. Its original southeast entrance being blocked, so the original entrance here, 
and a new one being positioned here in the northeast. And this change may also represent a psychological change in focus of the nunnery um, to the northeast towards its parishioners as the new entrance faced the medieval settlement of Shanna Golden and indeed the putative medieval settlement around the nunnery itself, while the older entrance had faced towards the patron stronghold southwards at Shannad. And while there is no documentary or historical evidence regarding any anchorites or recluses at the Church of St. Catharines, um, the archaeology and architecture um, certainly suggests that there may have been at least uh, one there through time. And the first location which suggests an anchorite is, the low win is a low window in the 13th century fabric at the northeast corner of the church, which is shown here, which is blocked in the 15th century alterations but has an angled embrasure that when open would have given a clear view to the high altar from outside the church. And while this window may have been to help hear the bell at the consecration outside the church, its low position and angled embrasure could be interpreted as a squint, a common feature in anchor holds. The second location is the space that Westrop interpreted as the sacristy. Um, and interpreting this building as a sacristy is problematic in several ways, and it would work much better as a 15th century anchor hold. And its local name, the Black Hag Cell, which I'm sure you noticed on the earlier mapping, is very interesting, and the folk memory may recall its use as an anchor hold. The cloister as a whole is considered an important space, a symbol of monastic identity despite its divergence in physical appearance between religious houses and was a metaphor for paradise. And it would appear that the cloister at St. Catherine's based on its upstanding remains, as unfortunately it was too unstable to excavate, incorporated a pre-existing structure at its, as, its west, as its west range. This range is stratigraphically the earliest structure on site and it has unusual clasping pilasters on its upstanding southern end, which you can just see here, these features here. And it also has several blocked opes that do not seem to correspond with his use as a monastic range. And it is postulated that this was re a repurposed secular structure. So what type of a structure might it have been? The most likely secular candidate for the West Range is that it was originally a seigneurial hall or hall house being repurposed for the nunnery. Karen Dempsey and Tygo Keith have identified several hall houses with similar clasping pilasters, and a number of examples are shown here. This part of West Limerick, where St. Catharines is situated, has a particular concentration of hall houses, and Tom Dealey, shown here, is perhaps the best example of the group. Many of the nuns in St. Catharines may have had an elite background and may have been very familiar with such an elite building. Despite the lack of funerary monuments at St. Catharines, there are no grave slabs or markers and possibly one tomb niche, um, which is shown here. Five of the trenches opened revealed burials and a total of 15 individuals was revealed. Of these, six burials were recorded and left in situ, um, and these were not dated. They comprised two men, one woman, and three children. Eight individuals were fully excavated, and one was sampled, uh, the one in the foundation cut of the church, and all nine of these were dated and ranged from the 13th century to the mid-17th century. The burials represented five women, one man and one adult where biological sex could not be determined and two children. All the burials were extended supine lying on the back and orientated east-west with the head of the west in the Christian tradition. None had any associated grave goods and there was no evidence for the use of coffins either of timber or lead but one adult female whose knees and feet were very close together, suggested the use of a shroud or winding sheet, though no shroud pins were found with any of the burials. A single nail 
associated with this burial or was associated with the burial, but could not be interpreted as indicating that a coffin had been used. And interestingly, the earliest and latest dated burials excavated were of children. The earliest was a three to four year old buried in the North Cloister walkway and was dated to 1170 to 1270. And it's likely that the, it was the later range in the date. And the latest burial was a five to six year old child outside the church to the north and was dated to 1470 to 1650. So despite the relatively small sample then, men, women and children were represented from the earliest phases of burial at the nunnery. And these results are similar to nunnery excavations in England in that both women and men are represented. No clustering or segregation of burials by biological sex or age was noted. It was initially pre presumed that when we were excavating that the children and men may be representative of the 15th century parishioners when it is recorded that the nunnery church became parochial. But the radiocarbon dates, however, date many of these burials prior to the 15th century. And so burial of the laity in the nunnery must have been permitted prior to its church ever becoming parochial. It is possible that these people represent many others associated with nuns in the nunnery, such as priests, agents, servants, pupils, Karadians, visitors, patrons, and some were perhaps relations of the nuns themselves. So what have we learned and what conclusions can we make? Many archaeological monuments are considered static and unchanging, but in reality, few rarely were. The analysis of St. Catherine's and other nunneries shows they were rarely, if ever, remained unchanged. They should be considered dynamic places for the worship of God, but also as places for living, working and dying. Muller has stated that space is practiced place. So the continual use of the cloister and the church in the daily routine of the nunnery would have added significantly to its special qualities and its quality of space. The actions of the religious community of nuns using the space with the rhythm of hourly prayer and recurring rites over the liturgical year would have transformed the cloister into a space of meditation, peace and tranquility. The excavations at St. Catherine's have shown that the nunnery community were willing, perhaps out of necessity, to change their construction plans, making use of what was already constructed, and I suggest using a pre-existing secular structure as their uh, Western range. They permitted burial of non-nuns within the cloister ambulatories, the church and in the graveyard, of men and children, and perhaps some of the women excavated may not have been nuns either, because um, it was impossible to tell upon excavation if they were religious women or not. Um, and so we have presumed that some, that some of them at least were. Um, and they permitted this burial from the establishment of the nunnery in the 13th century. And although there is no documentary evidence, the architecture does certainly suggest that the nunnery may have supported an anchorite at various times in its history. So earlier historians have suggested that St. Catherine's nunnery was dissolved in 1428 or 1432 because its church became parochial. But the archaeology rather suggests that the nunnery continued. The community embraced the change to a parish church by altering the architecture to accommodate its new purpose and changing the very essence of how the nuns had used their church space previously. It is also possible that the nunnery changed focus from patron and benefactor to their newly found parishioners in the adjacent medieval settlements. So rather than being a failure, as many nunneries are sometimes depicted in older scholarship, St. Catherine's can be considered as a success as it functioned from its foundations in the 13th century to its dissolution sometime in the 16th century, and it still stands today. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic, Tracy. Thank you very much. If you stop sharing your screen. Brilliant. We will um, take questions. I'm, I'm going to use chairs prerogative uh, just just for a second. Um, 
I think this this whole issue about the parochial to you know or, or not parochial status is interesting because obviously in 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 England an area I know better you know very many yeah. of the the female monastic churches were both throughout most yes. if not all of their, their history so I think that's that's really fascinating and um that's just a comment and my only other comment is that I think what you've just told us tonight really shows the value of how we need modern fresh excavation of female monastic sites which is something I think has been sorely lacking you know not just in Ireland but certainly in England too so um, that that's really exciting new data you presented us um, I'll hand over to Rob because it's not it's not my job to to ask questions or make comments. And I know he's got some questions to uh, put to you. OK, yeah, thanks, Hugh. Um, I'll say the most popular question is about whether there's any documentary evidence or any sort of evidence to suggest how many nuns are likely to have been in one site at any given point. Um, yeah, well, um, for Ireland in particular, I know um, I know in the English nunneries, they say that there's very little documentary evidence relating to them. In Ireland, we have nearly none. <laughs> so we only have like two um, very short visitation records. Um, and they are very, they're very, they're kind of early, late 15th century, early 16th century. Um, and we can't tell from those visitation records if they're actually speaking to the entire community of nuns because they they mentioned five or six names and and that's all um so i would imagine the community at saint catherine's probably was never more than 15 to 20 and i'm just basing that on the dormitory uh the dormitory in the west range you can you can see the spacings of the windows in the dormitory um and then you can extrapolate how many more were there and there's about 12 uh, windows. Um, and you would imagine then if you're if you're looking at like in the male houses that in the dormitory, each bed may have had a window. Um, you're probably looking at community of 12 or so, 12, maybe 12, maybe up to 20. Of course, it would have fluctuated over time. But guessing the guessing the size of community is exactly it. You're just estimating. And then we also have to take into consideration all of the people who supported the, the nunnery, but who were not nuns. Um, but anyone's guess is, is as good as mine, really, within, within, uh, within, within reason. But I would imagine the community was about 12, 12 to 15. Well, thank you. Um, another question is, um, if you could explain just a little bit more about the the context of what life as an anchorite might have been like in in, in some of these instances yes um anchorites are very interesting people um and we have historical evidence for anchorites in ireland but we have very little archaeological evidence um and i know in england there is archaeological evidence for anchor holes um, and an anchorite or a recluse was somebody who went through, they first needed permission from the bishop to become um, an anchorite. Um, and there was a ceremony um, where you would be enclosed within your cell. So you would not be permitted to leave. Um, and of course, that meant that the, the people who were immediately outside, so if you had an anchor, an anchorite in a monastery or a nunnery, it would be the community, the, the religious community who would look after them. Um, but the, the irony about recluses is that they probably weren't very reclusive at all because they drew people to them. So I'm thinking of one in the 12th century in Ghent, who was um, very famous, and she had kings and princes and queens coming to visit her for um, advice and uh, prayer. Um, so these people, these recluses seem to be very charismatic. And we have some writings um, about how they may have lived or instructions for how they may have lived in um, the Ancren Wise. And there's been a lot of um, scholarship done on the Ancren Wise about, you know, what it means and where it has come from. Um, but we have um, a lot of the Anchorites were in their cell and they were kind of contemplating their own death. So some of them would have... Um, dug their own graves within within their anchorite cell 
Um, and so there's there's very little archaeological evidence for them, but um, it will be very exciting to find an anchor hold and um, and excavate one. So maybe when I have more time and money, I might go back and do the one at uh, St. Catherine's. Right, just yeah, one more question then is um, we give the fact that these buildings evolve through time. Um, if you had a burial in the foundation cut of the stone church, does this imply there might have been an earlier timber phase to the nunnery? Um, I would I would imagine in in the case that I was looking at the um, this the the body was in the foundation cut of the church, which would imply that the foundation cut was dug first and then the burial came along later. Um, now, we didn't find any evidence of a timber structure prior to the stone structure, but that doesn't mean to say that there wasn't one. And I do know that there's evidence at nunneries in England that would have had a timber phase. And all, it's also um, suggested, and I actually suggest it for St. Catherine's, but I didn't get into the detail of it, that um, stone structures and timber structures may have been contemporary, so they may have been used together. Um, so by all means, you could have had timber structures first, or you could have actually had them at the same time as the stone structures. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. I'll hand back to Hugh now. Well, no, well, all, all I'd like to say again is uh, thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I think you've given us a lot to think about. I mean, I wasn't expecting anchorites coming in as well and um, everything. So that you've crossed all sorts of areas there which i think could give us all food for thought so um and it's it's fascinating as i you know i said it before i'll say it again to see some really fresh research on this kind of site which is desperately needed um so i hope to get more money to go and do some more <laughs> um, is what i'm saying so um thank you very much you've given us a you know a great little insight um at st catherine's um and i'd like to thank everyone else for joining us tonight and i do hope you'll be able to join us next month um for our next lecture on on viking graves in ecclesiastical and non-ecclesiastical contexts in the um irish sea area so um, thank you to the speaker again and thank you to all and we'll see you next month. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome.